Over the last 30 years, there have been thousands of reported sightings of unidentified flying objects over the British Isles. You think I'm bloody daft, but this is a UFO. In the summer of 2008, reports of flying saucers and other crafts were capturing the headlines again. Over the years, numerous eyewitnesses, including military personnel, police officers and experienced airline pilots have testified to seeing strange lights in the sky and other mysterious phenomena. Very bright yellow object. It was uh, nothing like an airplane that I'd ever seen before. It's the brightest light I've ever seen in my life. Many of these UFO sightings remain unexplained to this day. But what or who were they? Could they really be evidence of extraterrestrial life? Yes, a strange, small red light. Weird. It's coming this way. Oh, it's definitely coming this way. It was just something out of uh, a science fiction film. It was totally unbelievable. Tonight, we hear firsthand from those who witnessed them and examine the truth behind some of Britain's most celebrated UFO sightings. In 1977, Broadhaven in West Wales became notorious as a UFO hotspot. There have been a number of calls to the police station. Every call referred to objects in the sky. Dozens of witnesses claimed to have seen mysterious lights and objects around the village. It was an orange object, which seemed to be split into well, I several... Would, one, one or two segments. Yeah. The number of sightings left locals shocked. What on earth was that? Experts baffled. We could offer no explanation. And even sparked a Ministry of Defence investigation. The Ministry don't tend to do investigations of UFO sightings. It's extremely unusual. The phenomenon would become known as the Broadhaven Triangle. In February 1977, Nine-year-old David Davis was playing with his friends when they noticed something strange in a field behind their school. A silver cigar-shaped object um, about the size of a bus popped up from behind some trees as if it was trying to take off. I don't know whether it was stuck, but it seemed to pause for about two or three seconds and then disappear back behind the trees again. It was only, only a matter of seconds that I actually saw the object, but it, it imprinted itself on my memory forever. The children ran back inside and alerted their teachers. Ralph Llewellyn, uh, who was the headmaster of Broadhaven School at the time, he got us all together and in exam situations, he got us to draw what we'd seen and describe it as well. At the time of the sighting, Hugh Turnbull was chief reporter for local paper, The Western Telegraph. I had a call to say that the children at Broadhaven School had seen something remarkable. They didn't actually say they'd seen aliens, they didn't say they'd seen this thing hovering overhead. They'd seen something inexplicable. Hugh drove down to the school to interview the group of children who were aged between 9 and 11 years old. He wasn't anticipating what they were about to tell him. I spoke to the head teacher, Ralph Llewellyn, and he showed me some of the drawings that uh, the children had done. And it was evident that there was some similarity between the drawings. Some were a bit far out. Some showed alien figures, some didn't. But in general, they were showing the same sort of object, the same shape of object. And uh, having those pictures made it obviously a very much more exciting story. Initially skeptical about the story, Hugh decided to retrace the children's steps. 
He asked one of them, David Davis, to take him back to the place where the object had been seen. I took a look around the field. We were looking really for any sign that an object had been there, be it from this, uh, this planet or another planet. There were no car tires or, or tracks or anything, but a telegraph pole cross member had been dislodged and was now sort of sitting at 45 degrees. Their journey took them past the gates of the local sewage works, which lay directly behind the field where the sighting had occurred. Liz Philpot, an administrator at the school at the time, had her own theory as to what the children might have seen. Later in the afternoon, we walked down the lane to the sewerage depot, and there are big wrought iron gates there, so we rattled on those until someone came out, and it was the man in charge. And I asked him, in confidence, to tell me whether or not um, his men had driven a tanker down into the, the field. And he said, absolutely not. No way could we get down there. I think these children, whatever they saw, it was something unusual. And a sewage tanker, I don't think, would have fitted into that category. Also, it would have been a very difficult uh, place to get a sewage tanker into because it was steep. I think the, the, the weather had been wet, so there would have been signs of tire tracks. Many of us came from farming backgrounds. Um, so we knew it wasn't anything agricultural. Persuaded by the children's testimony, Hugh decided to run the story. I think I recognised immediately that this was a, a much bigger story than we'd had previously about uh, UFOs. I don't think I realised how the story would take off and it would become a major international news event in the way that it did. In the winter of 1977, a group of children in Wales claimed to have seen a spacecraft hovering behind their school playing field. When the story hit the newsstands, Broadhaven, a small seaside village with only 600 residents, suddenly found itself the focus of intense public interest. An investigation has begun into a claim that something strange came out of the skies and landed in the Welsh village of Broadhaven near Haverford West. Whatever it was, was spotted by children from the local school. We just couldn't carry on normal lessons. The, the phone was going off every, every couple of minutes. We were even getting researchers and interviewers from as far afield as Australia, New Zealand, America, all wanting to talk to the people who'd seen the flying saucer. The incident at Broadhaven Primary School appeared to be a baffling one-off event. Until reports of other strange sightings began to surface. Five miles from Broadhaven in the village of Herbranston, Maureen Deiter also witnessed something for which she had no rational explanation. I was out one day during the week having a bit of fresh air at night and I happened to look up in the sky and I saw this cylindrical object with lights on it and it was going very fast. So it was only a question of really seconds that I actually saw it. And I thought, what's that? I couldn't believe my eyes. The village of Littlehaven lies one mile down the coast from Broadhaven. Local resident Dorothy Cale was setting off from home one evening when she too observed something strange. We went out from our house, which was on the cliff top at Littlehaven, and there were, there were some flashes, very, very bright flashes, which lit up the whole village. All of a sudden, there was a, a very strong light. The driver put her foot hard on the brake quickly. 
there was the brightest light I've ever seen in my life, and it appeared to be inside a glass dome. Well, it took our breath away, really. We, we, we all of us looked at it. Nobody said a word. This was a strange thing. None of us said a word, and then all of a sudden, it, we didn't see it lift up or go anywhere. It was just gone. It, it flashed, and it was gone. And our driver said, what on earth was that? The light resembled nothing Dorothy had ever seen before. But astronomer Ian Ridpath has been investigating UFO sightings for over 20 years. He believes there's usually a very straightforward explanation for such strange lights in the sky. People in general don't know the sky very well, the night sky, and people can very easily be fooled by the sight of a bright star or planet, particularly when it's low down and particularly when it's twinkling. And at night there is really no way to estimate the size and distance of an object, and uh, people can think that something is actually much closer to them than really it is. Whatever the cause, the sightings in the area continued. Like the incident at the primary school, some involved more than one eyewitness. Stephen Bamford and Robert Best were returning home to Broadhaven after a night out when they noticed something unusual out at sea. We probably saw the people before we saw the object. Mm. Yeah, we wondered what they were all looking at. Yeah. We assumed it was probably the cliff was on fire. It did look like a fire, but it was obviously mm. out to sea and it moved from right to left. It was an orange, an orange object which seemed to be split into well, I several... One, one or two segments. Yeah. And then we thought we'd be brave and drive out there or drive in the general direction to see if we could sort of find whatever it was. And then as it moved across, or they moved across, they just shrunk and disappeared. Diminished on itself. Yeah. The men could think of no obvious explanation for what they'd seen. I thought it might have been a harvest moon or something at first. Well, you don't get a harvest moon at half past one in the morning. If it had been a ship or something like that, it, it couldn't have been in front of the cliffs at one moment and behind the cliffs at the next. Mm. So it was, it, it was a very strange anomaly, and that's, that's why everybody was stood out here watching it. Psychologist Chris French has made a study of the reliability of such eyewitness testimony. Now, in situations where we've actually got evidence from multiple witnesses... And that evidence seems to be telling pretty much the same story. Everybody is saying the same thing. Then we're quite likely to give that kind of evidence much more weight than single uncorroborated testimony. But one thing we should bear in mind is that when people see something unusual, such as a possible UFO sighting, then they will actually discuss what they've seen with each other. And we've got lots of good experimental evidence to show that one person's account of what they've seen can actually influence another. But with the sightings continuing to flood in, many were convinced that something strange was happening in Broadhaven. By now the police were being drawn into the mystery. There have been a number of calls to the police station. Every call referred to objects in the sky and always some distance away, uh, travelling in a particular direction and then just disappearing into thin air. People were ringing in and writing letters all the time. Um, the ones that I was more convinced about were the ones who said, well, I'd rather you didn't use my name, but I saw this. It was really the start of what they call the Broadhaven Triangle. They call it the Broadhaven Triangle an area here in Pembrokeshire where sensible, down-to-earth people are constantly seeing strange objects in the sky, mysterious lights. It's an area where an entire classroom of schoolchildren saw from their playground a UFO. The triangle encompassed the southeast of St Bride's Bay, through Broadhaven, down to Milford Haven and towards Haverford West inland. It was an area of coastline which changed dramatically from mile to mile. Could the area's local geography have been a factor in the sightings? There's a number of oil refineries and other industries around Milford Haven. Flares at night and uh, odd-shaped 
plant, but people around here would have been very familiar with that. Those have been there for many years before anybody started seeing UFOs. The number of sightings reported in the area meant that what had begun as an intriguing local story was turning into a much bigger phenomenon. It was what UFO researchers like Dr. David Clark call a flap. The word flap became associated with periods of intense UFO activity concentrated in certain areas from the mid-50s onwards. So it's a, it's, an, it's a word that becomes part of ufology from that point onwards. Now the first real flap that seems to have occurred in, uh, in the UK was the one at Warminster in the 1960s. For 10 years, the town of Warminster in Wiltshire was famous for being a UFO hotspot. Unlike the Broadhaven sightings, the flap in Warminster began on Christmas Day 1964 with a mysterious sound. People were reporting hammering noises, things shaking the roofs of their houses, uh, machinery type noises going overhead, and when they came out and had a look, nothing was wrong. By May 1965, reports of lights in the sky had begun to surface. Local journalist Arthur Shuttlewood connected the lights and sounds, and the Warminster thing was born. He was writing for the local newspaper, and he got more and more obsessed with this and went out sky watching himself. The more he wrote about it, the more the story became part of local legend and lots of other people then started saying they'd seen things. It was the sheer number of sightings that made Warminster unique. We are stood here on Cradle Hill, which was the main sky watching location. Um, and every weekend, every Saturday throughout the 60s and the 70s, there could be up to 50 or 60 people up here observing and watching for the thing. Kevin Goodman was one of those who took to the hills, travelling to Warminster to investigate the phenomenon. It was very much a communal thing. It was like-minded individuals searching, looking for something, wanting to be part of something. After several months, Kevin witnessed something himself. Over in that direction, from over by the golf club, came four red lights, equally distant, spaced apart. They carried on travelling through, around and over to Battlesbury Hill, which is over here. They stayed in the line for approximately about two or three minutes, and the lead object then shot upwards at a tremendous rate of speed, performed a flawless 90-degree turn without stopping, and shot out of sight. And about 30 seconds later, the following three lights then just shot straight up into the sky. To this day, I can't really rationally explain what I saw. The sky watchers were identifying hundreds of UFOs in the hills. But how reliable were their reports? One of the important things about Warminster um, is that it is surrounded by various military bases and camps. There's an artillery school there. There are various tank training areas around there and around Salisbury Plain. The area was one used to military activity. Covering 150 square miles, Salisbury Plain was the largest military training area in the UK. And that wasn't all. 18 miles from Warminster, an experimental establishment conducted trials of prototype military aircraft. The ufologists would say that the reason that you get so many sightings near military bases is because the extraterrestrials are very interested in what's going on at those bases. Whereas it seems far more plausible to argue that what's happening is that it's the activity at the bases themselves. Like Warminster, Broadhaven was also surrounded by military bases. Close to the village was RAF Broadie, a base for search and rescue helicopters and a training station for military pilots. Could it have been that it was simply RAF activity that was responsible for the Broadhaven sightings?
Well, Broadly at the time was a very, very busy base. It uh, had aircraft taking off and landing as frequently as Heathrow Airport at some times of the day. So there's an awful lot of activity going on there. As RAF Broadley's community relations officer at the time, squadron leader Tony Cowan found himself fielding calls from anxious locals who'd seen things around Broadhaven they couldn't explain. We've had a look at the flying programme, which was uh, easily accessed, and see if we could uh, relate the time of the incident or the reporting to the time of activity that was taking place at our airfield or indeed in our area. Sometimes the answer was obvious. Apart from the, the training of the, the jet pilots, there would have been exercises involving our local search and rescue helicopter unit, uh, the local lifeboat stations and the Coast Guard as well. I can remember at least on one occasion, it was quite a big exercise involving all those people plus a Nimrod patrol aircraft to carry out a search. And it did take place at night and the Nimrod was dropping flares to illuminate the area so that the lifeboat could spot the target. But Dorothy Kale, who'd witnessed strange lights near her home in Littlehaven, wasn't convinced this was the explanation. We could see Broadie Airfield quite clearly, so we were very well used to seeing all sorts of lights and flares and things like that. It was nothing like anything we had seen out to sea or across the airfield. And RAF flight records didn't always prove conclusive. On some occasions we were able to explain by uh, relating the time and the date to known air activity. Uh, on other occasions we could offer no explanation. I think to the people that, uh, that saw something, they, they will always remain a mystery. <laughs> RAF engineer Gordon Bowden was stationed at Broadley in the late 1970s. Years of experience had taught him that military activity could often be misidentified. Helicopter beams, searchlight patterns can appear very strange depending on the, um, the compass direction that the helicopter is operating from and the search pattern that the helicopter is conducting. And to the untrained eye you'll get a visual which will look like a ball of light and then, if it moves a different pattern, you'll get the beam. But not all the UFO sightings around Broadhaven were witnessed by untrained civilians. Gordon also witnessed them himself. On two occasions at Broadhaven, I did see strange lights out at sea. These lights that I saw accelerated with such phenomenal speed. I, I cannot explain what they were, but my military training would have said we had no aircraft at that time that could have traveled that fast and changed direction so quickly could, because it would have killed the pilots. If flight activity at the RAF base couldn't explain all the Broadhaven sightings, then what could? Broadly was not the only military establishment in West Wales. Less than 500 metres away lay a secret facility. It was run by the United States. US military bases have been connected to some of the most celebrated and well-documented UFO incidents in Britain. Yeah, it's a strange, small red light. Weird. It's coming this way. It's definitely coming this way. Could these American bases provide any clues to what was being witnessed on British soil? In 1977, the village of Broadhaven in Wales became infamous for a series of supposed UFO sightings. Why were so many people reporting mysterious lights and objects in the area? With the RAF and local police unable to explain all the sightings, attention turned to the secret US base that lay 10 miles from the village. A seemingly innocent research establishment, the base became the focus of local speculation. 
It was a top secret establishment and those people that um, that worked within the facility were, were very strict with their security codes. They were very hush-hush about what was going on there and if you rang them up, somebody would say, U.S. Navy Brody, this is not a secure line. Why were they worried about secure lines if it was just an oceanographic research establishment? It wasn't the first time on British soil that there had been strange phenomena sighted around a U.S. military base. On two occasions, U.S. air bases in Suffolk had been at the center of supposed UFO activity. The first sighting took place in August 1956, when radar personnel at U.S. Air Force bases Bentwaters and Lakenheath observed something strange on their screens. The Lake and Heath incident caused all kinds of um, concern on both sides of the Atlantic. The Americans alerted the, uh, the Royal Air Force. The radar station uh, at RAF Neatishead uh, began tracking these same mysterious objects. And it led to a very, very bizarre evening in which waves of RAF fighters were scrambled to go look at this thing over Lake and Heath. Two aircraft gave chase, but failed to intercept or identify the object. Running low on fuel, they returned to base and the object disappeared from radar screens. The Lake and Heath case had never been fully explained and it's, it was the first of a whole series involving uh, military establishments in the East Anglian region. Nothing else significant was reported in the area for 25 years, until the night of December the 26th, 1980. Local garage owner Jerry Harris lived next to the joint US Air Force bases of Woodbridge and Bentwaters. He was returning home when he noticed some peculiar lights above him. My wife turned me to the helicopters. So I said, no, they're not. I said, because the helicopters are going to crash into the trees. The lights were hovering above Rendlesham Forest, which lay between the bases. What no one realised at the time was that this was to become one of the UK's most iconic UFO encounters. And they kept moving about, they went sort of down, downwards, and then disappeared. All of a sudden this uh, thing came out of the trees, when it got to the top of the trees it took off and uh, flew up into the sky, straight as an arrow and uh, disappeared out of sight and I couldn't see it anymore. Jerry decided to investigate the mysterious lights. I went round in my van to uh, ha have a look and I was stopped from going into the forest uh, by uh, an English policeman and a military policeman, they're both together. And they said I couldn't go through the forest. Um, so I had to turn around and come back. Jerry put the sighting out of his mind, and the Rendlesham incident seemed forgotten. Then, two years later, the story resurfaced after an anonymous tip-off to a national newspaper. It was in 1983 that the story first broke and became headline news. The news of the world got hold of this story and put it on the front page. A UFO lands in Suffolk, and that's official. This blew the story wide open. Nick Pope used to run the British government's UFO desk at the Ministry of Defence and has investigated the Rendlesham Forest incident. With Rendlesham, what you had was a report uh, from the deputy base commander of uh, one of NATO's most important military establishments. And here he was saying not only had some of his personnel witnessed a UFO, but he'd seen it too. Colonel Holt is probably the most senior military officer ever to have gone on the record with a first-person written account of a personal UFO sighting. With the story now out in the open, an extraordinary piece of evidence was released by an officer from the Woodbridge base. A tape recording of Colonel Holt's investigation. Colonel Holt took a small team of men out into the forest to investigate and he recorded his observations as he went out into the forest. Did you saw a light on there? Where? 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 Where?
You can hear the, the tension in Colonel Holt's voice. Uh, you can hear the tension actually in all of Holt's team. Okay, we're looking at the thing, it looks like an eye winking at you. It, it sort, of, sort of has a hollow center, a dark, dark center. It's, it's you know, like a pupil of an eye looking at you and winking. This is unreal. We're turning around and heading back toward the, the base. These are not people who mistake aircraft lights for, for something more exotic. When these people say um, and go on the record uh, as saying, we experience something above and beyond uh, anything we've ever seen before, you can take that to the bank. A UFO sighting made by several credible military witnesses made the Rendlesham story unique. Astronomer Ian Ridpath has investigated a number of UFO cases and was keen to get to the bottom of the airman sighting. When the Rendlesham Forest case hit the headlines in 1983, um, I realised that I actually had to take this case seriously because it had um, you know, good, apparently very good evidence. But conversations with locals soon convinced him that the Rendlesham case was not all it had first appeared. From the position in the forest where they saw their flashing UFO, you can actually see straight to the Orford Nest lighthouse, which appears to hover between the trees, not very far off the ground. And as you move towards it, between the trees, the light seems to recede in front of you, uh, which is exactly the effect that the airman reported as they moved towards this flashing light, but they never actually got to it because it, it got further and further away. I've been to Rendlesham Forest at night, and anyone who's been to Rendlesham Forest at night uh, and has seen the lighthouse will, will realise that it's a tiny pinprick of light in, in the distant horizon. There's no way that Holt and his team could have misidentified that for something more spectacular. Jerry Harris and the US Airmen had reported that the lights in the forest had moved in strange directions. But this too could have had a rational explanation. I knew from experience that bright meteors or fireballs, which are natural pieces of debris from space burning up in the atmosphere, can give the impression that something has come down quite nearby. I was able to find from the British Astronomical Association that indeed a bright fireball had been seen at that same time that the men had seen something apparently descending into the forest. Ian Ridpath's evidence suggested that the UFO was nothing more than a combination of unusual but naturally occurring phenomena. It appears to be an absolutely uh, superb, almost inexplicable case, but when you look at each of those aspects individually, there is a rational explanation for each of them. But this conclusion didn't satisfy everyone. If the lights did have a rational explanation, why were the Americans so reluctant to discuss it? All the Americans I knew from the base, and none of them would talk about it at all. They weren't allowed. And they had strict instructions from up above not to talk about it. So I couldn't find anything from them whatsoever. They would just try to cover it up. When a wave of UFO sightings had hit Broadhaven in West Wales in 1977, attention had also turned to the US military. Not far from the village lay a secret US base. When strange lights and objects were reported in the area, speculation grew that the Americans were developing secret, state-of-the-art military technology. Nobody really knew what was going on there, so I think it's quite a possibility that all this could be linked to some sort of military activity. But when the base was deactivated in 1995, the truth about the Americans' activities was finally revealed. As it turns out, they were, they were listening for, for Russian submarines at the height of the Cold War. Far from developing prototype weaponry, 
the mysterious building had housed nothing more than banks of computers and monitoring equipment. This revelation put paid to the theory that the mysterious lights in Broadhaven had come from the secret US base. But the sightings were about to take a bizarre new turn with accounts of more than just unexplained lights in the sky. Two months after the first sightings, dozens of eyewitnesses reported seeing strange silver figures around the village. Police officer Ernest Jones personally investigated one of the sightings. A call came into the control room there, and I happened to be in the station. Um, a report of a sighting of a silvery figure quite close to a dwelling. The call had come from the Coombs family, who lived on Ripperston Farm, a few miles from Broadhaven. Although the Coombs no longer wished to talk about the night's events, Ernest Jones remembers them well. So here I was going to a farm on a dark night, in the middle of the night, not knowing exactly what to expect, but expecting to get close to something that nobody knew nothing about. So a few things were going through my mind. We arrived in the yard, went to the front door, doors open, we went in. There's a family there, established with a husband and wife, spoke with the wife, she was very, very frightened. Got over her eyes, she saw a silvery figure moving about very close to the window. Her husband, he, he turned round and saw this figure very close by the window outside, but he'd been sitting. He was really frightened as well. And we're not talking here of a softy man working nine till five in an office. We're talking of a man and quite used to going out of the house all times of day and night, checking on cattle. No way would he come out of the house with us. No way. So we went out, we had a look around the house, around the back, um, the garden, the fields nearby, the cattle pens, checked machinery. With the silver figure nowhere to be seen, PC Jones returned to the house and made arrangements to evacuate the family. From the condition they were in that night, especially Mrs. Coombs, she didn't feel safe, and she didn't feel that the, the house was safe for the family. The Ripperston farm incident was not an isolated one-off. Reported sightings of strange silver figures were taking place all over the area. With the mystery deepening, the investigation would now step up to a new level. The MOD branch, which was responsible for UFOs, they had received um, quite a few um, letters from members of the public and they'd seen all the, 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 the lurid um, press coverage of the Welsh Triangle. And there is a, there's one particular memo from the, the head of the, the MOD UFO branch to the RAF police. There's a lot of concern in West Wales. Something's obviously been seen. Some of these witnesses are quite level-headed, reliable people. Could you make some discreet inquiries into what's been seen there? The very fact that the military were interested was very, very unusual because the ministry don't tend to do field investigations of UFO sightings. It's extremely unusual. The Broadhaven Triangle was now being taken seriously at the highest level, and an MOD investigation was underway. Its conclusions would be completely unexpected. They call it the Broadhaven Triangle. In 1977, Broadhaven in West Wales became known as a hotspot of UFO activity. Claims of lights, strange objects, and even silver figures were being made by dozens of local witnesses. Six months into the sightings, the MOD decided to launch an investigation. 
in itself an unusual occurrence and something not made public for nearly 30 years. Before the Freedom of Information Act came into force, uh, you have to remember that the default position of the Ministry of Defence, an inherently secretive organisation, was to say nothing. In 2005, the Ministry of Defence's report on this incident was finally made public. It does look as if um, some discreet inquiries as they described at the time, were made. And, the, and the, the answer that came back, which is mentioned in, in, a, in a briefing to the Defence Intelligence staff later in 1977, was that a practical joker was behind some of these more bizarre reports that had reached the Ministry. The practical joker revealed himself to be Glyn Edwards, a local businessman from Milford Haven. We had a round table uh, dinner and the theme was a fancy dress dinner. So, um, as it was topical at the time, I decided to dress up as a spaceman. So I borrowed an industrial suit from one of our local suppliers. <laughs> I went to the dinner and before the dance had started, I went out to the car to remove it, but some of my colleagues said, let's go around the village. So we all jumped in the car. Bumped into a few people, turned a few heads, and uh, after about 10 minutes, we decided to go back. Going back then, we stopped outside the Haven Fort Hotel. I started walking up the drive in this uh, silver spacesuit, and they had the headlights of the car behind me, so I was silhouetted going up the drive of the hotel. All my colleagues were hiding in the bushes at that time, and one of them said, there's somebody in the window. I went a bit further, another one shouted, oh, she's got a gun. And I thought, right, that's it. I dived under a rhododendron bush and lost my footing and rolled all the way back down to the road. One of them said, let's do it again. I said, not so likely, if she's got a gun, I'm off. So then we went back to the hotel, changed out the suit, and we just carried on with the, the dinner. With such an obvious explanation for the Little Haven sightings, why were so many people willing to believe they'd witnessed something extraterrestrial? We know that eyewitness testimony can be very, very fallible. People genuinely and sincerely believe that they've seen something that day which defies any conventional explanation, but the evidence from psychological studies would suggest that we should actually take those accounts with a pinch of salt. But the hoaxer has always denied responsibility for one sighting, at Ripperston Farm. PC Jones, who investigated the incident, has kept an open mind. I can't help thinking of, of the state they were in that night. There was something certainly out of the ordinary that frightened that family. As 1977 drew to a close, the number of UFO sightings in the area began to decline, and the unusual events were consigned to memory. Given the large number of people who saw it and the number of pretty intelligent people who came forward and said they'd seen something, I think most people think there must have been something behind it. Not necessarily flying saucers, but uh, something. Because we didn't know what it was, we just sort of ignored it and decided if we don't know what it was, we can't talk about it. And, and it just, uh, you know, that was it, it just went away really. For many who witnessed the Broadhaven phenomenon, it remains something that they find difficult to explain. I'm a very rational person and I, I, I say I don't believe in UFOs, but having seen something unusual myself, but I I, it, seems so, it seems ridiculous to me really to think there's, there's something from outer space that's come down and settled in Little Haven. There's no physical evidence, there's no photographic evidence, and, and that's a great shame because I think most people uh, have an open mind about the whole business, and, uh, and I think if you look into a night sky, uh, you must believe that, that there must be something else out there. Uh, what it is, I don't know. I'm absolutely sure of what I saw that day. I saw an object that was large, cigar-shaped, silver, after 30 years, I'm no nearer the understanding than I was on the day that I saw it, but I am 
100% sure that what I saw that day is as we reported it. We follow three women who decided to forgo traditional medical care and have their babies at home with no professional assistance or pain relief. Extraordinary People Next sees just how they got on. But the pilots believe these are computer errors. Have you ever seen something like this before? No. Never. Doesn't make any sense. Hey, even if there is a leak, it doesn't explain the alarms on the oil system. And everything was okay at the last few check at 30 West. Oh. Bet you it's a computer problem. The task of finding out if there is a fuel leak is made harder by the design of the Airbus systems. The systems monitor hundreds and hundreds of sensors and, uh, you know, they can be affected by, uh, you know, such mundane things as a little bit of uh, frost or ice on a sensor can, can, uh, can cause it to pre present bad data. There is no direct warning to show if the fuel level is falling faster than the engines are consuming it. So the pilots receive no immediate indication that there could be a fuel leak. The fuel quantity isn't rising in the tanks for the right wing. Check fuel quantity. It's very low. Hold on. When co-pilot de Jager carries out the fuel calculations, he discovers something is seriously wrong. It's much less fuel than we should have. It looks like a fuel leak. Check again. De Jager finds a disturbing difference. According to the, all the gauges, all the tanks in the right wing are way below the level they should be according to the flight plan, and, and there's hardly anything in the other ones. What about a trim tank? There's nothing there either. Yes? Hello, first officer here. Can you come to the cockpit, please? Sure. Although Captain Pichet still believes he is dealing with a computer problem, he nevertheless decides to ask for a visual check just in case to see if there could be a fuel leak. Captain? Hi. Can you and Karen uh, take some flashlights and go to the windows if you can see anything trailing back from the wings? It'll look like a mist or a stream and report back immediately. Okay. Dirt. I want you to do another complete fuel check, please. I'm so sorry. In daylight, the fuel pouring out the back of the wing would have been clearly visible. But in the dead of night, even with a torch, the fuel leaking from the engine is impossible to see. evidently realized that the situation was not improving and uh, at that point they realized that there's that their circumstances were becoming more serious and uh, I think that there were probably some discussions took place between the two pilots as to what their next course of action should be if the computer is correct then with the amount of fuel remaining the Airbus will no longer be able to make it to Lisbon Captain Pichet is forced to divert the flight We've got a direct. Get onto Oceanic Control, where's the nearest airfield? Transat 236 Heavy Santa Maria Control, can you advise nearest airfield? We have a possible fuel problem. The nearest runway is over 300 kilometers away. With the fuel remaining, Lages Military Air Base on the tiny island of Tercera in the Azores should be within reach. Santa Maria Control, Transat 236 Heavy. Proceed to 30 flight level 390 direct. 350 miles to threshold. Are you declaring an emergency? Stand by, Santa Maria Control. Not yet. It must be the computer. 
Transat 236 Heavy Santa Maria Control, no assistance required yet. Flight 236 continues flying south for the next 25 minutes. Everything in the cabin seems normal. But in the cockpit, the fuel readings are getting worse. Must be the computer. Well, I've checked. There's nothing in the trim or center tank. And the gauges show only seven and a half... According to the fuel gauges, the plane is using fuel much faster than normal. Whether they believe the gauges or not, the captain has no choice. He must warn air traffic control. We have to declare a fuel emergency. Transat 236 Heavy Santa Maria Control. Santa Maria Control, Transat 236 Heavy, go ahead. Transat 236 Heavy, declaring fuel emergency. I really hope it's a computer bug. <laughs> because if we land in the Azores, we'll have a plane full of fuel, they'll crucify us. But at 6.13 a.m., less than an hour from the first fuel alarm, the full gravity of their situation strikes home. The right-hand engine runs out of fuel and cuts out. We're losing engine number two. I don't believe this. Okay, maximum thrust on number one. What's going on? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. The lights started flickering on and off, which I thought was kind of odd, strange. On one engine, the Airbus will not fly at 39,000 feet. They must descend quickly. Try to transfer fuel from center tank and the trim tank. Transferring. Fuel quantity is reaching zero. This can't be. We're not gonna go completely dry on this airplane. All right, we can stay at 39,000 feet with just one engine. We'll descend to 33,000 to control our speed. 236 Galages Tower, we have lost one engine, engine flame out. Roger, Transat 236. We can see you on primary radar. You are at 135 nautical miles from Lages Field. We are 135 nautical miles from Lages Field. For the next 10 minutes, the stricken Airbus continues on its one remaining engine. The pilots still believe that the computer may be partly faulty and that they can make it to La Gesse with fuel to spare. In the end, might be all right. Fuel gauge is falling fast, though. It's, it's nearly hitting zero. Thirteen minutes after the right-hand engine cut out, and with 157 kilometers still to go, the left engine begins to fail. We're losing number one. Mayday, mayday, mayday. We have lost both engines due to fuel starvation. We are gliding now. One of the most sophisticated airliners of the modern era, carrying 306 passengers and crew, is now nothing more than a giant glider, drifting steadily down towards the ocean. Excuse me, can somebody come? Um, you can literally hear a pin drop. The, the, the exterior, there was no sound in that plane, in that cabin at all. A lot of people were praying and um, screaming for God. List of functions we've lost. We have no more stabilizer. Blue and yellow hydraulic. No ADR 2 and 3. No anti-skid. No reversers. Rudder trim. Radio HF 1 and 2. Lost With the loss of both engines, we have no electrical system. If the engines aren't running, the generators aren't running. So there's, there's no power on the airplane. There is a, a small device, it's called a ram air turbine. It will deploy from underneath the fuselage near the wing fairing. 
and it's 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 a small propeller that deploys out the bottom of the fuselage and it spins in the wind and that small propeller will provide very limited electrical and hydraulic systems to run the aircraft. In other words, although it's a glider, at least it's a controllable glider. Calculate how far we can go with our glide angle, will you? Um, well, we're now at 30,000 feet at the rate of descent of 2,000 feet per minute. Oh, we can hang on, hang on for 14 or 15 minutes. What? I don't want to die on our honeymoon. I was just trying to calm her down, like, try and reassure her that everything would be okay. It's a very big struggle um, to stay calm when you're considering your own death. Without power, the plane loses 1,000 feet in height for every five kilometers it travels forward. They can reach the Azores, but if the pilots make a mistake, they may face a forced landing on the water. We have to ditch in the water. Air Transat Flight 236 is now drifting without fuel over the Atlantic. Although their initial calculations show that the plane should make it to La Gesse, Captain Pichet must now follow standard emergency procedure in a passenger jet over water. Prepare the cabin. The cabin's slowly depressurizing. We need to put our oxygen masks on. The loss of engine power means the cabin will soon depressurize. Oh. Everybody, please, I need your attention. We are preparing to ditch the plane. I need you to put on your life jackets right now. Within probably, I'd say, two minutes, um, I saw flight attendants with life jackets in their hand running down the aisles. Obviously, that was a, a sign of fear. Um, what, you know, what was happening was the first question that popped in my mind. You know, you don't really know what to think. Um, but people did start to panic at that point when they were told to put on life jackets. This isn't working, all right? It doesn't work. Remain, please keep her calm. It's not working. She's so dumb. My best friend was talking to his father. His father died three years ago. But he's talking to him because he thought for sure he was going to be joining him. Ditching a large passenger jet on the water presents a severe hazard. If the Airbus 330 has to make a forced landing, the chances of survival are bleak. In my personal opinion, I don't think these airplanes would make very good boats. Typically, uh, an airplane with a low-mounted tail like this as it enters the water, one of the first things that's going to hit the water is the tail. And it's probably going to be ripped right off. And the fuselage is probably going to open right about in there. In 1996, a Boeing 767 ran out of fuel off the coast of East Africa. Its last moments were caught on amateur video and reveal what happens when an airliner attempts a controlled landing on water. Of the 175 people on board the Ethiopian Airways jet, only 50 survived. The chances of it surviving a, a ditching and floating for very long are not very good. If Air Transat Flight 236 has to carry out a similar maneuver, it faces an equally grave outcome. With over 100 kilometers before they reach the Azores, the pilots face a long and difficult maneuver. They need to keep the plane gliding for more than 15 minutes to reach the Azores. Transat 236 Heavy to Tower. Lajas Tower receiving Transat 236 Heavy. Do you have us on radar, Transat 236? We have you on primary radar. Confirm you're at 80 miles out. Your heading is good. Transat 236 Heavy Lages Tower, we are trying to make the runway. Please, Please describe runway, heading, and length. 
Lagis Tower turns at 236 heavy. Runway is 33 and 10,865 feet long. Airport dead ahead on your present heading. Please advise when you have it in sight. Transat 236 Heavy, we cannot see the airport. We will tell you when we can. As the minutes tick by, the long wait for those on board is agonizing. That's it, That's, this is it, this is, it's over. They're just gonna die in the next five to 10 minutes. I had contemplated the idea that we would die certainly and kind of you can I think in that moment you can accept it more than you think you would accept it the torture of the whole fact that you're gonna die which I totally thought I was going to is worse to me than dying if I'm gonna die just kill me now just just get a gun and shoot me or just let this plane go down and nose dive into the ocean and then just die instantly on the ground emergency services prepare for the crash landing of a fully loaded airliner With 20 kilometers to go, the crew now prepare for the most dangerous part of the operation, getting their plane on the runway in one piece. Heavy Delages Tower, do you have our distance from the threshold now and weather, please? Roger, Transat 236 Heavy. You are eight miles out according to primary radar, airspeed 280 knots according to our reading. Visibility unlimited. You should have the airport in sight. Negative, Lages Tower. Until now, we cannot see the runway. There is no room for error. Without power, the pilots have only one chance at landing. If they miss or overshoot the runway, the results could be catastrophic. I got it, just to the right. Minimum rat speed is 140 knots. Maximum speed for gravity gear extension, 200 knots. I'm not lowering the gear until the last minute, okay? Okay. The crew struggle to lose height and speed for landing. Roger, Laja, six nautical miles. Let's open the slats. It'll slow us down a bit. Slats out and locked. As they approach the runway, their speed increases dangerously. Too fast, and they could run off the end of the runway. Lower the gear. Hold on. Speed is about 200. All right. I stabilize the speed. Can you give me a landing speed, please? No engine, no flaps. Ideal approach speed is 170 knots. We're too fast. Yes. But the runway is very long. Captain Pichet now performs a difficult series of swerving maneuvers to slow the plane down for landing. The plane was almost on a like a 45 degree angle. I thought it was just gonna it was just gonna flip over and just nose dive straight down. The plane was circling around the island to slow down. So then we saw land and then we saw water. And when I saw water again, it really struck me that, you know, our chance for survival had maybe was gone. The runway is long. Yeah, sure, but at the end is a 400 foot cliff. If we don't stop in enough time, we're toast, we're dead. The crew line up the giant Airbus for the final approach. Line the gear down and locked. Three green. No flaps. Only the emergency brakes. No spoilers, no reverse thrust. 4,000 feet, 195 knots.
3,000 feet, 197 knots. Two thousand feet, two hundred knots. Alert the cabin. Cabin crew, one minute to landing. <laughs> Hang on. Let's go. Vertical speed at three thousand feet per minute. We're going way too fast, and the speed's increasing. Two hundred and three knots now. It's way too fast. 1,000 feet, 201 knots. We'll try to get the nose up. We'll ride fast. But even if the crew can get the Airbus on the runway, they face a further problem. Without engines, the normal procedures for braking are severely restricted. The danger is far from over. The pilots must land the plane without power and somehow get it to stop. hits hard at high speed. The tires have blown! Captain Pichet tries to hold the nose down. After bursting eight tires, the plane finally stops in the middle of the runway. I just wanted to get out of this airplane quickly. I jumped, I hit the ground hard. It's my, I don't think my, my rear end actually even touched the chute at all. I didn't slide down the slide. I ran down it and they're just, get out, get out, get out. So you're just running out of this aircraft. What in God's name just happened? I, I, I fell down to the ground literally and I just started, I started crying. I mean, once you're off the plane and you're evacuated, you want to know what happened. Pichet and de Jager had flown their Airbus without power further than any passenger jet in history. As news of their remarkable achievements spread around the world, they found themselves reluctant heroes. You don't have time really to think about anything else than taking care of the, of the safety of your passenger, you know? That's your main goal, and uh, since we didn't have any engine, the other main goal was to make the landing safely. So at that time, I guess the experience came in, you know, with the help of my colleague, that's why we, that's why we made a successful landing. You train for the worst, but you never know how you'll be, deal with uh, situations like this. And um, reflecting afterwards, I feel uh, we dealt uh, in the most professional and uh, complete wa matter we could. A feeling of being grateful to see all the passengers uh, were okay. You know, something like this happened. You never know what what is going to happen. Really, I mean, you don't you stop not to believe it. I mean. Uh, Makes no sense that a big jet with two engines has no more power with 300 people on board, you know. But although the public story was of success, disturbing questions remained. Why had a highly sophisticated airliner run out of fuel? What exactly had happened to Flight 236? Away from the cameras, an accident investigation began immediately by the Portuguese, Canadian and French transport authorities. Initial checks quickly confirmed that all the fuel tanks of the Airbus were indeed empty. But to lose more than 17 tons of fuel in such a short space of time meant they had a major leak. The question was where? 
Engineers examined the fuel system, searching for faults in the tanks and the fuel lines. It wasn't long before they found what they were looking for, just by the right engine. In this particular case, you had a hydraulic tube that's relatively small by comparison to the larger fuel tube. And the hydraulic tube, due possibly to pulsations in the hydraulic system, were abrading against the larger tube. And eventually the larger tube uh, had a leak in it, and the leak, or not the leak itself, but the, uh, the hole eventually possibly led into a fracture of the tube, allowing this massive fuel flow outside of the engine. The investigators began checking Air Transat maintenance records. They discovered that on the 19th of August, five days before the flight, Air Transat had removed the right-hand engine for maintenance and installed a replacement unit sent by Rolls-Royce. But as they analyzed the repair logs for the engine, they uncovered a shocking mistake. This was not a case of faulty design, but of faulty maintenance. Rolls-Royce had supplied the engine without a hydraulic pump assembly. To overcome this, Transat mechanics had used the parts from an older engine. But they didn't fit properly, and the pipes had been rubbing together for five days. Until midway over the Atlantic, one finally broke. The engine was delivered minus these two tubes and a bracket. That the purpose of that bracket was to maintain adequate clearance. So if they took the bracket off the old engine and put it on the new engine, is that the pipes would be locked together so that they could possibly abrade. As investigators questioned Air Transat mechanics, they found more disturbing evidence of malpractice. The chief mechanic testified that he had been concerned about the substitution of another hydraulic assembly. Five days before the accident, he raised his concerns with his superior. The company decided that the aircraft must go back into service and could not wait for the missing parts. He should go ahead with the substitution. The replacement parts only differed from the correct ones by a few millimeters, but it was a difference that nearly cost 306 lives. A few days after the accident, Air Transat publicly accepted responsibility for the faulty maintenance. We have to realize that there was a small uh, a mistake uh, made uh, in terms of changing the pump. Uh, we installed it, uh, but then uh, some, some, some uh, pipes, uh, so to speak, uh, were needed to be connected to the pump and there was a mismatch. The immediate consequences for Air Transat in that event was that they got to pay a fine of a quarter of a million dollar, which was the highest ever in Canada, for an error that could have been prevented. How someone that is supposed to be qualified in their job can put the wrong part onto an engine and risk 300 people's lives is, is, is beyond me. This incident is a very strong reminder that regulation is important and safety is important and lives will be lost in the absence of that. And they're real lives. It's not just, you know, this imaginary figure in your head of 300 people. It's real people who suffer and continue to suffer as a result. If it hadn't been us suffering, it would have been our families. This was by no means the end of the story. Investigators now turned their attention to the cockpit itself. And what role had the crew played in the events of August 24th? Could they have done more to avert the crisis? Key questions remained unanswered. Questions about what happened on the flight deck. Transport Canada investigation into Air Transat Flight 236 discovered that basic maintenance errors had led to the fuel leak. Air Transat had accepted responsibility and were heavily fined. But the focus now turned on the flight deck and the performance of the crew, 
What part did they play in the fuel loss? Wing cross feed. On. On. When the crew opened the cross feed valve to transfer fuel from the left wing tank to the right, they lost 17 tons of fuel in less than 30 minutes. Yet they failed to close the cross feed valve and prevent further loss. We have lost both engines due to fuel starvation. We are gliding now. In the days after the incident, Captain Robert Pichet and Dirk de Jager were called before the inquiry and asked in detail about their actions. More than two years later, these findings have still not been published. What follows are possible explanations for the court.